To get us started this afternoon is uh, a gentleman that's no stranger to any of us. Um, Nolan Doskin is here to present the facts of the matter on 2012's historically low year of moisture. Uh, Nolan is the state climatologist. Uh, he's a lifelong weather enthusiast, a data collector. Nolan's been at Colorado State University with the Colorado Climate Center since 1977, serving as the assistant state climatologist until his appointment as state climatologist in 2006. And I uh, recently tuned in on one of your webinars, Nolan, and uh, I found it very enjoyable and informative both, so uh, keep up the webinars. Uh, otherwise, I will turn over the podium to you. Thanks for being here today. Good to see you. Uh, this thing advances them, right? Maybe. Maybe. Looks like an advance. Any tricks up your sleeve? I, oh, now they're advancing. Very good. We're good. Okay, it's after lunch. Snooze time for climate data. Uh, you know the story already. And I think those of us who were involved in, in uh, the early planning of the water celebration, Water 2012, uh, coinciding with the 75th anniversary of the Colorado River District and CWCB and, and a number of other entities, we sort of had this inkling that if we really put our heads together to celebrate water that we probably wouldn't have that much water that year, but that that would very likely help focus our attention on why we really do celebrate what water we have. And so I'm going to do a relatively quick uh, review of what we've been through uh, uh, these past few months and where we stand now, and then I will venture into the land of speculation and forecasting if I have time. <laughs> and I might find that I don't. <laughs> uh, just so you know, the new 30-year average uh, every decade, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration updates for the entire country the climate quote-unquote normals for uh, the basic climate variables and uh, the Oregon State University PRISM Climate Group then maps those new normals and that new map was just completed this summer that is your new national map, and if by chance I compared it to the previous national map, you would see that they are largely the same, which is a good thing, uh, especially on that scale. Uh, yeah, there's subtle differences, but we found in, in Colorado we dropped the decade of the 70s out. The 70s were a fairly dry decade. Replaced it with the decade of the 2000s, a relatively dry decade, and the 30-year average stayed about the same. Uh, but there's the local map for Colorado. Uh, again, you know the picture. Greatest precipitation accumulation in the high country, and you live, those of you who live here in the valley, it is a dry place where you get to watch the storms nearby and you get to receive the water that comes from the surrounding high country. It's a beautiful arrangement that we, that we have. Uh, just putting uh, th this into perspective, and, and you know this, you just know this, but when you see it graphically, you wonder how in the world are we actually able to keep a relatively steady water supply for all our users, knowing how variable it really is from year to year. And at any given location, it's even more variable than that. That's the statewide annual 
precipitation year by year from 1895 forward. You see the wonderful year of 2002 on there. You see the roller coaster years of the of the two of the 1990s where we had some really every other year had a big year. Uh, then you see what looks like uh, several years of near average precipitation uh, here this decade, this past decade, uh, but remember last year, 2011, which came out as an average year statewide? Northern Colorado, huge wet year. Southern Colorado, huge drought year. Statewide, average. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, when you look at those numbers, keep in mind you're averaging over over 100,000 square miles. So, uh, so the, then the question, of course, is where do we end up? And we don't have the, the final numbers. We won't for a while for 2012, the 2012 water year, but it'll only be a few weeks before we can put a data point on this graph. And it's going to be fairly low. It's not going to be as low as 2002. It's probably not going to be as low as 34 or 54, but it's going to be in the bottom 10 years unless the next uh, 17, however many days we have left in the month, really delivers uh, a punch, and I'm not seeing that in the next few days at least. Uh, so we have these huge variations to deal with. Uh, in all aspects of our climate, but it's particularly precipitation. And as we think of our conditions this year, 2012, think about what it would have been like had this not been what we were experiencing just a little over a year ago, 2011. That's up on the tower snow tell above uh, Steamboat Springs and you can't see it, it very well, but that's 200 inches of snow, just about covering up all the top of the poles of their data collection system. Uh, that was a big snow year. That was uh, April 6th, and I believe the snow got deeper yet at that altitude before it started to finally, finally go downhill. Uh, putting this year on the graph, now this is a statewide number again. This is your, your statewide average annual snowpack on April 1st. Your snow water equivalent averaged over the many NRCS snow measurement data points. And you get to see on there some of your favorite droughts and your favorite wet years. Uh, snowpack doesn't correlate one-to-one -one with water supply because what happens after April 1st still makes a difference, uh, but it's a pretty strong correlation, especially for your higher altitude west-facing basins. But you see 1977 on there, pretty ugly year. Uh, 1981, a bad year, squeezed in between a whole run of wonderful years. Uh, then you see 2002, which looked no worse but no better than 77 or 81. And then you see 2012, just 10 years later, just about the same stinking bad as 2002. It got there from a different route, but let's see how we did get there. This is just for the Colorado River Basin itself. Uh, just the upper Colorado uh, group, so that would be from Grand Junction uh, upstream up the Colorado River main stem, take all the snow tail stations, average them together, and that would be your, the nice smooth line in the middle is your long-term average snow accumulation peaking in early April, melting out slowly in April, then quickly in May and leaving in June you see two back-to-back -back years there. You see the 2011 season, that's the high one. You see the 2012 season, that's the low one. And how's that for variability? Like it? <laughs> Was it easy to deal with? Are you glad that 2011 happened? It gave some challenges dealing with high water, uh, but it behaved, the snowmelt in 2011 behaved remarkably well considering what could have happened with that much snowpack. Uh, it really came off 
as well as you could expect, better than you could expect, quite frankly. And then there's 2012, where we dogged it. We didn't do too bad the first October and November. Uh, December, we started to lag. Uh, January got a little bit of activity later in the month. We thought, oh, mate, we're making progress. February, eh, dogging it again, but sort of keeping up with average, uh, below average, but tracking near average. And then I was on the Western Slope for a meeting. A couple of you, I think, were in the room uh, down uh, Montrose in early March. And Montrose looked like winter wonderland, just a beautiful all-day snow. And uh, drove to Grand Junction, pretty decent snow here in town, too. And that turned out to be like the last of winter. And that was the first couple days of March. And that was it. And we expect big springs, especially March into early April. And it just didn't happen. Again, it didn't melt real fast in March, but it's not supposed to melt in March. And it did. So that's the turning point of this particular year was just how bad March was. I want to show you a national map uh, comparing March of 2011 with March of 2012. And of course, 2011, Texas drought was coming on strong, New Mexico, Oklahoma, uh, and uh, things were pretty wet in the, in the Northwest. But it, looking at that map, if you don't look clearly, and, you, and with the color as it is, and brightness, you can't see it that well. I see it better on my monitor than, than you're seeing it. But it, most of Colorado was actually dry in March of 2011, with the exception of the Colorado River head, headwaters where we got dumped on in March of 2011. By comparison, 2012 was a regional uh, dry month from northern Mexico right up to the Canadian prairies north of the Dakotas. Uh, and it was one of the driest months, marches, in the history of Colorado. It was also the warmest march on record for many states. And subsequently, we could sort of feel it then. It says, what are the chances of recovering when you really stink up the place in March? And the answer is, March is not a month that you want as a dry month. Uh, and that certainly played its way out this time. Uh, all right, what am I saying here? Despite all we claim to know, oh, it's not always obvious and it's not readily, easily predictable. I must be talking about the future. That's a, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, but trying to figure out what do we know about what caused the back-to-back -back 2011 wet year and then the 2012 dry year, and then can we extrapolate anything from that to 2013? Uh, I just want you to look at your favorite index, your multivariate ENSO, and uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. That's a graph running, what, 1950 to last year. And you see that if you're in the blue, that would be La Nina land, and the red is the El Nino land, and we had been in a La Nina, generally considered a bad deal for Southern Colorado, and the southwest U.S. and a pretty good deal for the northwest U.S. and maybe okay for northern Colorado. Last year was one of those extreme cases that, wow, it played out even more dramatically than history has shown with southern Colorado being super dry, northern Colorado being super wet. What's happened since then? Well, uh, and some of you heard Klaus Walter give his infamous seasonal prediction last year where he confidently said that the 2012 water year would be drier than the 2011 uh, one for the Colorado River Basin. And I would say, when he said that, I said, you know, the chances of you being wrong on that forecast is very small. And sure enough, he, he was right, but I don't think he thought it would be anywhere as near as dry as it became. Now, in just the last few months, we've made the transition from second year 
La Nina towards a sort of a small shaky El Nino right now and that's what we're going on as we try to figure out what happens next. Again, let's see, I was here at the end of February, the beginning of March last year, and you had, that's the Grand Junction accumulation of snowfall compared to average for last winter. And you see what that average is? That's a whopping, what, 19 inches? Whoa, are you a snowy place for you who live here in the, in the valley? Uh, and last year, we were dogging it, looking like it was gonna be the least snowy uh, winter on record and then it snowed a whopping two inches there right in early March and it eclipsed the previous record so it didn't set the record but it didn't snow again after my visit uh, so what's that a month a, a seasonal total of eight inches you call that snow how many of you live between Delta and and Fruta and Palisade how many of you live where it actually snows? All right. Both climates have their advantages and their disadvantages. Uh, so we've had this very interesting one-two punch, but this year was a one-two punch of not only poor snow accumulation, but this really warm weather, consecutive months, starting in March. And this graphic shows month by month, statewide, broken into four divisions, Eastern Plains, Front Range, Lower Foothills, High Mountains, and then Western Slope. So there's four divisions. And in this particular year, month by month, uh, all parts of the state have done more or less the same thing at the same time. And that shows you that starting in March, we had this huge departure from average backed it up with a warm April, bad combination. You don't want to end the water, snow accumulation, early melt season with back-to-back -back warmth. That's what we did. May, not as bad, but again, statewide warm. June, just ridiculously hot and dry. July, Interesting, usually some of you enjoyed generous moisture in July, usually above average precipitation and cooler than average temperatures go together, but this year it was above average temperatures and either dry or wet, depending on what part of the state you were in. And then I don't have August on there yet, but August, I don't think I do, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nope, August isn't there yet. August was another warmer than average month. That's six in a row and seven out of eight months above average temperatures statewide. And September has been tracking above average as well. It's not as dramatic as those previous months. This is not a good pattern. Those of you who came over from the front range, this is the Denver day-by-day -day temperatures for the water year. Uh, and those smoother graphs show the average high and the average low, and the actual bumpy ones show what's happened this year. And we have been consistently above average starting right there at the beginning of March, especially for daytime temperatures during the period of time when plants use water, evapotranspiration stress. Uh, so let's look at the national picture and where we fit into that. This was where we stood back in 2010. This is a depiction of the U.S. Drought Monitor. If there's no color on it, that would be you're either doing good or you're doing great. If there's color, then you're not so good. And if there's bright, dark colors, that means bad drought. So that's where we were in September of 2010. Colorado, a little dry across the northern part of the state, pretty good across the south. The Texas drought had not begun. Now watch. By April 2011, Western Colorado had fared well. Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma fared badly. Southeast Colorado, Rio Grande, and the Arkansas fared badly. Uh, then the spring of 2011 came along and brought relief to the Platte and the Republican and left only the Rio Grande and the Arkansas in trouble. Uh, almost as bad as the adjacent areas to our south. While well, you guys up in the Colorado River Basin, other than southwest Colorado, were doing just fantastic. Then 
Over the course of the winter, poor snowpack accumulation over much of the Rockies, and you see the spreading of the drought. Let's go back, and that's August of 2011, that's February of 2012. Notice Texas was getting better. It got a lot better. And, but the West as a whole got worse. Now watch this. We go from February to April. Let's do that again. February to April. Ooh, Colorado. The Colorado River is getting worse. Darn it. Hate it when that happens. And by July, we were epicenter of this is early July. D4 had crept its way into the Yampa. A little bit in southeast Colorado. We were the epicenter and fortunately there was some relief for the high country of Colorado and the Four Corners area in the month of July, a little bit more in August. It got worse to our east on the Great Plains and Midwest. It got better in the south and it, a little bit better here. But this isn't a great picture for, for our country. This is widespread drought. This is why it's been in the news for a long time. Hurricane Isaac did bring beneficial moisture up the uh, Mississippi and then turned to the east. Definitely some improvements. We've had, we've been limping along. We just had our wettest two days in several weeks, yesterday and the day before. Uh, just zooming in and you're, you're settling into your nap now, so don't get too comfortable. Uh, this is Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming, the month of June when it was so dry. Now I want you to see the granularity of the July beneficial moisture. There it is, where the blues are above average, the really dark blues are as much as triple the average. There was some of that in the upper Colorado. Uh, but other areas like Grand Junction missed out on a lot of that July precipitation and it didn't make its way into southeast Colorado at all. And Wyoming, that had been doing so well, has been on the short end of the stick. And now the month of, of August where the monsoonal moisture continued to come up across Arizona into Utah, not so much into Colorado, but still beneficial tracking near average here while very dry in our part of the state east of the Continental Divide. I uh, just wanted to show you some outcome as we wrap up here from our Ag Weather Network, about 65 stations across the state, the Colorado Agricultural Meteorological Network, COAGMET. We have several West Slope stations, one at, at actually one right at Wolford Mountain Reservoir. Uh, and we use those stations to help track evaporative demand. Uh, doesn't tell you what actually evaporates. It tells you what could potentially be evaporating based on the meteorological conditions. And this is based on our stations near Olathe. And this year's line is up near the top, which means near record. And the record year was 19. Right, I'm out of focus. Is it 94 for the 94? And you see the line in the middle is the average and then the low, no, low years down below. So we've had a high ET, but not as high as the highest. We were tracking near the highest until the monsoonal moisture arrived in July. Uh, going over and looking at that same graphic for a location in southeast Colorado, we were at all-time high record evaporative demand uh, in the Arkansas Valley based on the heat and the lack of uh, humidity we've had. Uh, put it all together, you, the great integrator, of course, is stream flow. There's your two years, that's the uh, hi, hi, uh, hydro, excuse me, the hydrograph, you guys are asleep, aren't you? Uh, the hydrograph on the Colorado River at the Colorado-Utah state line, it's last year's and it's this year's. You see even greater magnification in stream flow of the variability in precipitation, where it's literally a factor of four difference in volume stream flow, maybe even more than that from last year to this year. 
Uh, and yes, we did get a little help in July and August so that we're not continuing to, for, to see stream flows going down further, but we have been down down lower than we would like to be. Now it's base flow time of year from now until the next runoff season and let us hope that we have something to add to that. Occasionally fall moisture happens in sufficient quantity to actually increase stream flow. It's not too late for that to happen. I do want to show you as I wrap up the statewide depiction of drought that shows the biggies that we faced since 1890, which we had major drought episodes around the turn of the last century. We had the drought-free period from about 1905 to 1930. We had the Dust Bowl years of the 30s where much of the state was experiencing drought for several consecutive years. Uh, better in the 40s downhill again in the 50s, sort of roller coaster ride in the 60s, then the severe drought period of the 70s, culminating in the drought of 77, then rapidly getting better after that. So many people have had most of their hydrometeorological experience roots in Colorado in those 1980s, 1990s years. Those were way drought-free years, similar to the pre-1930 period. And so it was no big surprise when 2002 came along. We were really rolling in the goods prior to that. Uh, that drought, yes, it was widespread, intense, but not even as long as previous drought periods that we've had. Took us a while to recover from it. Took till about 2007 till we said we'd close the books on the 2002 drought. But now it's only taken us a few years to try drought again. So right now, do we know where we stand? Is this another big drought period or is this another 1981 where we squeezed a bad year in between better years? Well, I don't think I know. Uh, again, as we contemplate that, think about the El Nino that we sort of lean on for forecast information because it gives us more information than most any other tool, but it doesn't give us all the information. It just gives us some. And based on what we're seeing, the overall consensus is we could have more decent fall precipitation. Uh, we've just had the best storm we've had in a long time. Statewide average of about almost, well, about 85 hundredths for a statewide average for the last two days, which is not that bad. Could use a few more of those. Uh, consensus would suggest reasonable start to the winter snow accumulation in the high country as we get deeper into fall. And then it says, who knows what's going to happen in midwinter, but it may not bode as well as we would like for the upper Colorado main stem. Maybe better for southern Colorado, south, the southwestern states. And then next spring is a big, huge unknown. This is not a strong El Nino. It's a sort of a shaky one that may have a, long, a shorter life than the, than the ones that are associated with more generous moisture supplies. If you do a general correlation of that index that I showed uh, with Colorado precipitation and Colorado stream flow, prolonged El Nino periods tend to be wetter periods, prolonged La Nina periods tend to be drier periods, but what happens in any individual year isn't always so closely associated. But I will tell you that one way or another, we will keep tracking this. Uh, and you are welcome to join us. A few of you already do join in a weekly, or at least occasional, we're not doing it every week, but we've done it almost every week since last January, an update webinar where we're tracking conditions where people can sit in and in fact chime in on what they're experiencing in their parts of the state. It's a part of the NIDAS, which is a program operated by NOAA, National Integrated Drought Information System, an effort to improve drought early warning system in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, uh, you don't have the time or inclination to write down those websites, but if you want to join in and be on our email list, uh, 
please let me know. That's the kind of information that we provide. Uh, again, not giving you the chance to read it. But if you're interested in being a part of the NIDIS webinars, just give me a business card and I'll get you on our list. No obligations whatsoever. You'll just get one or two emails a week. Uh, and then you'll each Wednesday or either Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday morning, you'll get a weekly narrative assessment of how things are looking climate and water wise. And of course, did you think I would come to the podium without a rain gauge? <laughs> how many of you have read your rain gauge in the last two days? How many received more than a half an inch total in the last two days? Not that many. The valley didn't get it here, but some areas. Paonia, the big winners, over an inch. A uh, little area south of Montrose managed an inch. Uh, but we need you, people like you, the people you work with, the people you serve, the more volunteers, the better we do of monitoring and get your favorite teacher involved too so that the kids get a chance to do the measurements. Here is the power of volunteerism. That was yesterday's national map of volunteers that are part of the little project we started in northern Colorado after the drought of 2000 or after the flood of 1997 actually is what started it, then the drought of 2002 got a bigger interested community, and that's the map for yesterday, just for Colorado. We do have d data points scattered all around, but we need many more. Also want you to remember that we do track climate trends on our website of the Colorado Climate Center. And you, they're updated every month so you can keep a track on how things are looking. I did want you to see this does not yet have 2012 on it, but this is the historic statewide statistic on temperatures for the spring months in Colorado. And yes, we have had a run of warmer springs that date back over 20 years. We had a, a break from that last year and the year from before, and it did result in a little better runoff than we might have had otherwise. Uh, but 2012 will go in there as one of the really hot ones, maybe not quite as high as 1934. And then the summer, we are on a way high run with just an occasional interruption. Uh, 2004 and 2009 were each a little cooler. But other than that, we're pretty sure that the n summer just ended June, July, August will be the hottest on record when we get these numbers put in there. And that is not a good picture. So that is it. There's our website for the Colorado Climate Center, my email address. I'll be around till the end of the day. So if you want to be on the NIDIS drought webinar and listserv, just give me your card. Thank you. Any questions? There's one. Depends on where the tree ring is sampled. Then they're very good about sampling tree rings that are in areas that are responding to natural precipitation. So tree rings give you a pretty good story of the past. Every now and then they'll have some anomalies that don't track with what actually occurred. But in general, they tell you a lot about the past. And it's a question of how to use that for the future. How does a person get a rain gauge? Does it explain on your website? Uh, rain gauges are available. I don't give them to you. <laughs> I make you buy them. <laughs> uh, but I have a couple with me. And go to our website, and you can order them online. And uh, get one, sign up for Kokoraz and then send in your data. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nolan. Appreciate it.